In continuing to talk about calorimetry, as you might imagine, the instruments that are used to measure or as calorimeters can be very simple. And the one on the left here is a very simple model that was very similar to the one I used when I was in high school, or quite expensive, as you can see the one on the left, right here with the automatic stirrer and a, a precise um, thermometer. The simple processes, heat is, is usually transferred from a hot metal to cold water until both are the same temperature. And then you measure using weights, and we'll do a, a problem or two based on this, to uh, figure out how much heat is transferred and so forth. The heat of the metal inside a a situation like a calorimeter, the heat of the metal plus the heat of the water has to add up to equal zero. Therefore, the heat law or ga gained by the metal, or in this case, usually it's the heat lost by the metal, has to equal the heat gained by the water. Chemical hand warmers, and these are kind of cool, they produce heat because the reaction is exothermic. And what you do is you pinch this, you take one that looks like the one on the left here and you pinch that little metal disc and it initiates a precipitation reaction, which is the white stuff precipitating. And when the precipitation reaction occurs, then heat is produced. So let's say we have a 360 gram piece of rebar that has a specific heat of capacity of 0 0.115, it's dropped into 425 grams of water whose temperature is 24 degrees, and the final temperature is 42.7 degrees. What is the initial temperature of the rebar? All right, let's take a look at how we would do that. So you start out, you know that the heat lost by the rebar has to equal the heat gained by the water. And the heat lost by the rebar can be expressed as the mass of the rebar times the specific heat of the rebar times the change in temperature of the rebar. And that has to equal the mass of the water times the specific heat of the water times the change in temperature of the water. And if TR is the um, rebar's initial temperature, then the mass of the rebar, which is 360, times 0 0.115 times the initial temperature, which is TR minus the final temperature, which is 42.7, has to equal the mass of the water, which is 425, times the specific heat of the water, times the initial temperature of the water, which is 24. I'm sorry, it's final minus initial. So the final temperature of the water, which is 42.7 minus 24.0, and this has to be 42.7 minus TR. And this, remember, this is a negative sign. And so you have 360 times this times this has to equal this side of the equation. So minus 41.4 TR. 1767.78. All of this has to equal 7947.5. And this is a minus sign here. So the initial temperature of the rebar is 235 degrees centigrade.
Now, there's one problem with that, and that is that it doesn't take into account the fact that the water might steam as you put it in there, and there's some stuff that happens that we would have to take into account if that were to happen. But according to, if I did my math right up here, the... Um, It should be that temperature. Now continuing on, a instant cold pack, as I said before, is solid ammonium nitrate and water and you break the pack of water and shake it up and when you dissolve the ammonium nitrate in water you get a cold endothermic reaction and this then removes thermal energy from your body. And the heat of reaction plus the heat of the solution has to equal zero. So the heat of reaction is equal to a negative heat of solution. So if we have 3.21 grams of ammonium nitrate and it's dissolved in 50 grams of water and the temperature drops 4.6 degrees, what is the heat of reaction, what is the sign, and what does that sign mean? So let's take a look at this one. First of all, we have to write the equation, which is the heat, the heat of reaction is minus the heat of solution. And the heat of solution is going to be 1, which is the specific heat of water, times 50 plus 3.21 for the mass of everything inside there. You don't have to worry about the specific heat of the of ammonium nitrate times the change in temperature, which is 4.6 degrees. And if you do the math on this one, you get 244.766 calories which to the right number of significant figures is 3, so that's 245 calories. And it's going to have a negative, I'm sorry, the, heat, the change in temperature was negative. It, the initial temperature was 24, and the final temperature was 20, so it's actually going to have a positive sign because this whole thing is negative. And so it's going to have a positive sign. And a positive sign means that it's an endothermic reaction. Now a bomb calorimeter is called a bomb calorimeter because it actually it explodes inside the calorimeter. And it's used to measure the heat produced by reactions where a combustion occurs and the reactants and products are frequently gaseous. The process remains at constant volume, which is why it's called a bomb calorimeter, so that you eliminate work as a factor. The reactants are in this gas-type bomb, which is then submerged in water and surrounded by insulators. So if we burn glucose in this type of calorimeter with a 775 gram sample of water, and the water is heated up from 23.8 degrees to 35.6 degrees. And the bomb itself has a heat of reaction, heat or a specific or a heat, specific heat of 800 or heat capacity of 893. And the specific heat of water is 4.19 joules per gram per cap degree centigrade. What is the heat of reaction? So let's take a look at how we would do this one. So the formula is the same. The heat of reaction is going to equal negative the heat of solution. But the heat of solution now is going to be the combination of the water heating up and the bomb calorimeter heating up. So the bomb calorimeter heating up will go is 893 times the change in temperature, which is from 35 or 23.8 to 35. Point, this is all negative, by the way. Um, 
So that's going to be what 12, 11.8 degrees plus the mass of the water, which is 775 times 1 times 11.8 degrees. I'm sorry, not 1, but 4.19. It's not calories, it's joules. And if we do the, the math here, this part is 38,200 joules plus 10,500 joules, or a total of 48,700 joules, or 48.7 kilojoules, and it's going to be negative sign. So it's an exothermic reaction that produces 48.7 kilojoules of heat now, nutritional calories are a little different. If you look on your labels or your food, you'll find that a serving has a certain number of nutritional calories. But a nutritional calorie, a one capital C calorie, is equal to a thousand little c calories. So a nutritional, one nutritional calorie is a thousand regular calories. So macaroni and cheese here has the all these various nutrients but it in a serving of one cup it has 250 nutritional calories which is which is 250,000 uh, regular calories new this nutritional information is always contained on labels on food thermodynamics which is something we will talk about some more um, in a few lectures during this class, is the science that studies energy exchange in relation to either physical or chemical processes. The internal energy of any particular substance is the total energy contained within a system or substance. This is why I told you that you had to make sure you understood what system and surroundings are. You'll see here that the U, which is the internal energy, is the total energy, possible energies within a system. So the internal energy U of the system, it's, it can be changed either by the uh, heat flow or by doing work. If heat flows into the system, and work is done on the system, the internal energy increases. So these are the two bottom parts, either heat going in or work being done on the system or both leads to an increase in the internal energy of a system. Conversely, if heat flows out or work is done by the system, then the internal energy decreases and the change is less than zero. So the change in internal energy is always equal to the heat plus the work. And the sign of the heat and the work depends on whether the heat goes in or out and whether the work is done by or on the system. So it's important to keep that straight.